billionaires are very easy. You know what the, the, the go-to is now? Being a trillionaire, right? So when you go out there, okay, aiming at a unicorn these days, don't think that it's hard anymore. It's pretty easy. Although, you know, it's, it's you gotta have the mindset, the hustling, the right team, the right partner, you can nail it, okay? Trillionaire is hard. $10 million only can buy you a lot. So once when you get there, you know what's the most difficult thing to do? Not to lose it. You get what I'm saying? Not to lose it. Okay, so even if you earn zero interest, you can use that $10 million for the next 40 years at $250,000 a year. You get what I'm saying, right? So $10 million can go a long way. <laughs> Your professor said that you guys wanted, some of you guys wanted to be investment bankers? Yes, no? No? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, you do know what an investment banker is? Because I was one. Oh. Okay, so an investment banker is a very fancy term for the low end, which is called a stockbroker, right? A stockbroker, you need just two licenses, Series 6 and Series 7. And then the stockbroker works for a brokerage firm, which a brokerage firm, there are two kinds. There are brokerage firms that do not take companies public, which is IPO, <laughs> right? Which they would call that a broker dealer, okay? My broker dealer, I was an underwriter. You guys know what an underwriter is, right? So when you are an underwriter, you become an investment banker. So then I was an investment bank. Does that make sense, right? So if you wanted to be an investment banker, then there's two ways. One, you get your series six, series seven, you work for a broker dealer, specifically a broker dealer that takes company public, and then you move yourself up to the ladder, you get deals in and you talk to your the owner of that company, and then if you get to their ladder, unless you are self-owned, right? Like me, you own your own company. You Then you automatically become an investment banker. But otherwise, you gotta work it and then you take the deal public. And if the company that you're working for uh, and they do underwrite that company as an underwriter, then you can consider self, yourself as an investment banker. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty much it. So John, taking the series of deals, like you just own your own underwriting firm, you don't have to take the series of deals? Oh no, uh, in the financial world, that's why it's different from cryptocurrency. Now, you guys follow me on Twitter. I talk about this a lot because that's my strength, right? In the traditional world, you have to have licenses regardless, okay? So when I own my own broker dealer investment bank, I have earnings product, that's required seriously. So as a firm, as a broker dealer, I gotta have all that licenses before I hire somebody to work for me to sell those products. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now you have a choice. Okay, that if you only wanted to sell products, you know, you don't want to hustle, then you get the six, uh, the, I mean the series 63, which is the state license, the series seven, and you can sell security, stocks, bonds, options, that's fine. If you want to sell annuities, insurance, you got to get the series six. So the, the long to short answer is that you do need licenses. It's a little different, but like I'm traditionally like investing in the economy and I've tried to learn more about like, Bitcoin and whatnot, and I've done my research. Like I look at like company vault, for example, I don't have a Bitcoin wallet. And I then went to ask like professionals at like wealth managers, and they essentially told me like they do what they're most comfortable with with history, which is the stock market. And I just wanted to get like so I've gotten to like what you think about that, because obviously the Bitcoin market is something you're very into and I don't really understand it, I know it's super volatile. I know there's not a lot of history that we've lost in the last like, two years. But the great market you can really do a lot of so. Okay. So the answer, okay, when you talk to boomers, which are most traditional Wall Street people, they're gonna give you the exact answer that you just shared with everyone, okay? Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are more for millennials. You guys are millennials, right? Yeah, you guys are seniors. So are you guys Gen Z? You guys are Gen Z. Wow, okay. So so um, millennials are very much into Bitcoin because they grew up during Bitcoin 15 years ago. Gen Z, what I've read is you guys are actually the special people. What I mean is that you guys are both in stock and crypto. Millennials are like 100% in crypto, you know, you know, ride or die, you know, types of, you know. So I fit more with you guys, okay? The cryptocurrency world is speculative. You guys know what that word is, right? What he was saying is stocks, stocks, they have the fundamental, the substance. So you can check the balance sheets, the income statements, you can compare the PE ratio. The PE ratio is what it tells you if the stock is overpriced or underpriced. I'm kind of keeping an eye on Nvidia. You guys know Nvidia? That stock's been mooning, right? Their earnings coming out tomorrow. So I'm keeping an eye on that one. So he's right in aspect is traditional stock is less scary 
because at least you can have something like the fundamental balance sheet to to make a a, a uh, an analysis of that company. You get what I'm saying? In in cryptocurrency, there's nothing. Cryptocurrency to me is like you go into Las Vegas and either you FOMO, you YOLO, you whatever, and then you either you know make it big or you go home. There, there's just nothing else. There's just no fundamental to right. But but if you look at the history of Bitcoin. The last time, which was 2017, I made that call when it was at 20. I was speaking at South by Southwest, and right in, on that panel, I said it's going to come back down below five. And there's a quote online that I said when it goes back to 5,000, I would bet the farm on it. So they quoted me, and I was dead on. It went down to 3,000. Right? Okay. But but here's the thing, you guys. I don't FOMO, and I don't YOLO, because when you FOMO and when you YOLO, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You only live once. You know, uh, 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 what's FOMO? Uh, fear of missing out, right? I don't do that because you, when you do that, you're still young enough to start over. Agree? I built my wealth, and every time when I lose a million dollars, it hurts me because when I go in, I go in big. I don't go in like five grand or ten grand. You get what I'm saying? So it depends on how we invest, right? So Bitcoin, if you're into cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is cool. Ethereum is cool, but there's a legal issue behind that. Everything else after that. It's exactly like you walk into Las Vegas and sit down and play that black game. That there is no guidance whatsoever. Don't listen to all these Twitter folks saying chart this and chart that. They, they, I mean, look, if those guys do their chart, which is technical analysis perfectly, they will be wealthier than Elon right now. Okay? So I've been on Wall Street. I know technical analysis. They're, they just help you to a certain aspect. They don't help you to know exactly where it is. So um, should you buy some Bitcoin now? Well, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say yes. If you see it come down, you can nibble some. I don't know, but Bitcoin's cool, okay? I'm not a buyer right now because then I'm, I'm chasing after it. The same thing as Ethereum, but keep an eye on those two. If it does come down, half of where is that today, then buy some for your daughter. Just a teeny, right? For her to go to college. But if it doesn't, just sit back and say, shit, I missed the boat. It's fine, life goes on, you know? So Nvidia probably makes more percentage than Bitcoin. Anyway, you get what I'm saying? There's a lot of investment out there. When you miss the boat, it's, that's not the only one. There's a lot more boats coming. You get what I'm saying? So, so that's my perspective. Does that help? Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Um, as somebody used to be really into cryptocurrency, do you think that um, it has drifted away from its original intended use as a currency to more of like a trading asset, or in most cases, a gambling? Oh, totally. Yeah. One thousand percent. Again, if you guys search, I'm pretty more. I'm pretty active on Twitter and. To some, I, I'm I speak out, you know, because because I'm an Aries. I, one thing about Aries, I hate people who cheat on other people. I mean, I, I, I so th there is this. I wouldn't say conspiracy. There's enough evidence uh, about the stable coin called Tether. You heard about Tether? Yeah. So they be putting out of thin air to pump Bitcoin. Whenever they print, it's exactly how Bitcoin goes up. So um, when Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, built Bitcoin 15 years ago, I don't believe that was his intention at all. If Satoshi Nakamoto would see where Bitcoin and the crypto space is today, I think he says, shit, I should not have done that. Maybe that's why either one, he was killed. Because you do know that Satoshi, he owns the most Bitcoin. And if he's alive, I mean, talk to me. We're all human beings, right? How is it possible that you don't even sell a tiny bit to just buy yourself a freaking Lambo? You get what I'm saying? He doesn't. So it's either one, he's my speculation. Satoshi is dead. Somebody kill him. Number two, there, there is research out there that it's the CIA who created that, the CIA. Because any human being like you and I, if we were to be Shatoshi, it's the human being nature that when you see that much wealth, oh, you, you're gonna sell something. I mean, you're gonna take your wife, your kid, your husband, pay for college, buy a Lambo, buy a man, you get what I'm saying? It, it's impossible a human being has that much money and they don't do that, right? So the answer would be yes, that the cryptocurrency 15 years post Bitcoin is nothing but scams, fraud, um, and manipulation. And that's the part that I really hate. So, and I, and I speak out about that on Twitter a lot, you know, so I hope it gets clean up and because I love crypto, that's the strange thing about me. I'm pro crypto, but I just hate bad actors. And there's a lot of them in the crypto space. Right. Did that make sense? Yeah. I'm thinking the same mindset too. Yeah. They just build, somebody popped it up. So you look at Twitter, it's just like all bots. Just like, like, yeah, exactly. It's the most annoying thing of all time. Especially right. after Elon acquired. One thing I love about Gen Z's is I think you guys are going to change the world. Okay? Any other questions I can cover today from real life 
experiences? Yes. So not like the person here, what have you found is like a good like customer acquisition strategy? Like what would you say because they can go to the firm? So how do you kind of bring people into the firm? You talking about my investment bank or just a startup? Investment bank. Okay. Well, my strategy when I was pissed off, he cheated me and I was adamant to find, to, to, to own my own BD, to take back what was mine. You, you get the fume in myself, right? The fire in me. <clears throat> I knew the only way that you guys would come with me because I was a new firm, keep in mind. I haven't proven myself, but you guys knew me because I recruited you guys there, remember, right? So I had to pay you guys more. So when I call each of you guys out to have lunch with me, and that was what I did. I paid a lot of lunches and, uh, you know, not pizza like the guy today. Um, so I went, one of because it's private because I don't know which one's gonna go with me and which one's not. You get what I'm saying? And especially I was negotiating with each one of you how much is Mr. Lee paying you? And then I would up that 10 or 15%. Like one of the biggest producing brokers at the time, he was doing like heck, two to three hundred thousand dollars a month, more than Jack. Remember Jack? Um, and so he said, Jenny, I'll go with you if you pay me like 97%. I said, like, fuck, 97%. So so for, for every one hundred thousand that that guy's making, he takes home 97 grand. And I pay them 1099. So they, they have to do their own taxes, right? I agree because you know why? There's one thing I learned on Wall Street when I, when I was around your age is that something of 100% is better than nothing of 100%. You agree? So at that time, I took the deal. I gave him 95%. He was the biggest producer because I got 3%. And guess what, guess what else I did by taking him to me? I killed Mr. Lee. You get what I'm saying? So you put all that strategy into perspective in the real world, that's how you come out with a solution that you might need. Don't think about, about hey, I'm paying him 97%, 3%, that's like nothing. But if you think the opposite, without him, you got zero. But with him, you still got 3% of nearly $300,000 a month. You get what I'm saying? And not only that, you kind of kill your enemy, right? So does that help? It's all about strategy. Did I answer you? Let me know if I didn't. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I have a follow up. So, this is like the first time you came forward for like, it was, I guess your heads was in deciding like when to take, like when, when to hedge whatever you were selling. So, how did you know, or like what was your strategy in terms of like going back to the NVIDIA example, if you were short the stock, like what would like, what, what you buy calls against it? Yes, okay. First of all, remember I go back, when you go out in the real world, the number one core is strategies, strategies, strategies. You gotta have a st strategy. Everything you do, you gotta think about it before you execute. So when I was a market maker, I made a few rules that I never break. Number one, even to today, I never, I never go short. Because you know why? When you go short, it's unlimited risk. You guys hear that word? Unlimited. It's not limit, unlimited. So I would never put myself there. Because unlimited, your company could go bankrupt the next morning when you wake up. You get what I'm saying? So take that away from you know, from me, so I never go short. So in the case of NVIDIA, if Professor Lee uh, were to sell NVIDIA and I had to buy it from her, um, then I would hold it in the house account and then I would monitor it. I probably couldn't sleep that night. Okay, you not see, very high stress, right? So I would wake up five o'clock in the morning, go into the office, turn everything on, and I will keep an eye on. Normally, over 90% of the time, I can probably exit the next day because the stock would swing back up and I would break even, <clears throat> that's a strategy, and I would sell. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes it would swing above uh, where she sold it at and I bought it at, and I would make a little profit, you know? Uh, but when I was making a market, I made a lot of money because number one, I didn't go crazy by making a market on all kinds of stocks. You get what I'm saying? I specifically chose the five or 10 that I knew if I were to take a hit, that I would be fine to hold it in my books. Of books and records. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so yeah, go ahead. Um, so, are you saying, are you saying that, so, basically, your whole strategy was you never, basically, you never take short sure sightings in the big. And so, I guess, so knowing that, would there be instances where you would say, like, you, someone has, someone sells on an Apple, you're there to buy the Apple, so you instantly go and like, sell the Apple when you strike against it, or would you like, always just always hold it and just hope the margin isn't like, Um, I, I do play margins. You guys know what margins mean, right? <coughs> um, yes, yeah, sometimes um, the stock would still go against me. Like I would hold the stock, but I try to flip it out the next day, but that doesn't always work, right? Now, if I said that, I would be a liar, okay? So I'm pretty blunt. So sometimes, let's say 30% of the times, uh, the next morning, the stock drops further. And of course, the first thing I would say is shit, fuck, right? 
and then I have to think. Now, sometimes if I, I do get scared because you're talking about millions of dollars here, right? I would sell at a 10% loss, right? But you, you gotta keep in mind, when I was making a market, let's just say out of 10 stocks, I would lose about 30% or even 50%. But if I make the other 50%, I kind of broke even. You get what I'm saying, right? What I try not to do is lose more than 50% and making less than 50%, then I would be in a hole, right? So when I was sharing with you guys, when I was about your age, uh, I was already a market maker. And that's when I uh, locked in my first millionaire. My mom was so proud. I was like instant millionaire. So I was aggressive, but conservative at the same time. Does that make sense? Because I knew how difficult it was for me to build my wealth up to that point. I gave you the story about Mr. Lee. Remember Mr. Lee? Okay. Um, and so I hate to lose money. So I either um, write calls, you know, he did mention it, right? If you guys learn about options, you can write calls against it. But the thing I hate about writing calls is as soon as you write the calls against your stock, you can't flip it. You're, you're stuck. Because the next day if that stock goes up, you'll call, you lose money on the calls. You get what I'm saying, right? So I try to keep the stock and either flip it or I cut loss at around 10 to 15%. Boom, gone, goodbye. And then I try to make that 15% loss somewhere else. Does that make sense? And that strategy literally works for me when I own not just one, but both, both broke dealers. My first one was acquired and then I built the second one. And then after that, I was done with, you know, broke dealers. Yeah. So it's all about strategy. And, and the thing about it is, once when you have a strategy, you must stick to it. You know how people say, I'm gonna do one, two, three, and then all of a sudden when you actually do a four opens up and five, that's when you lose. What happens just sticking to, okay, I'm gonna go home by midnight, I'm not gonna drink, uh, I'm gonna, you get what I'm saying? If you stick to your one, two, three, you should not lose. Anytime when you go out of your comfort zone, that's when you take more risk. More risk could be more rewards or you could lose more than that. I always tend to stay within the comfort zone that I knew I was very good at and I kept building my wealth that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Building is a lot harder than losing. That's why I was saying earlier, the hardest thing once when you reach $10 million is to keep it, not to lose it. That's the hardest thing. So, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yes. Um, why did you choose like the exit strategies like you did? Like you guys sold your company, but you just like stayed with it or try to like find you? Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, I'll give you a very honest answer. It's actually from Mark Cuban. I really like Mark. And Mark Cuban once said that everything in life has a value, has a number, right? The only time that it doesn't have a number is your spouse, your kids, your family. There's no number for that, right? Every business has a number for you to exit, right? Now, you've seen many founders, for example, the guy at WeWork, remember WeWork? He was adamant, he took all the way up to IPO and the IPO, Google this, this should be one of the case, like WeWork, went to IPO a couple years ago, it never happened. He lost everything, huge lawsuit happened, and he lost everything. So risk and reward, right? So to answer your question, remember I said I was in my comfort zone. First of all, remember I started at the beginning. Females, one, two, three, and me and Professor Lee were different. I'm not white, I'm not even a male, right? So I knew where my <coughs> limits are. And when it gets to a certain number, just like Mark Cuban said, everything has a number. So I had a number going in. So when someone wanted to acquire me and that number hits, I take it. So I'm fine with it. I mean, if you sell your first company, let's just say at 50 million, your second company, 100 million, your third company at 200, you're building. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, yes, be greedy, but um, but set yourself a limit because if you don't, you could lose everything. And I don't want to lose. I, I hate to lose. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. Any anything else? Okay. How do you diversify yourself from other ways that's in the same position? Diversify myself? How do you have like you have competitors of course, but there's another girl right next to you, she's thinking you're doing it. How do you have there? Well, you know, here's the thing about in the real world. No two can ever be the same. You know, Sam Altman of OpenAI, I'm sure you guys are using ChatGPT right now. No, right? Rough, that was my guy. Right? Even Elon Musk is scared of Sam Altman. You guys know that, right? So Elon Musk, he has a lot of fanboys, right? Smart, but he's not. None of us in this world will ever be Albert Einstein, even Elon Musk, right? Um, the NVIDIA CEO, right? His earnings coming out tomorrow. Elon Musk is probably afraid of him now. You get what I'm saying? So my answer is, if there is another female that does exactly what I do, I commend her because you know why? 
I empower women. I commend her. But am I fearful of her? Number one, never. I don't. Because she will never be me, and I will never be her. Now, she could surpass me, and if she does, I congratulate her. Because you know why? The world is so big. I mean, Elon Musk isn't the only one. There's Sam Altman. There's Mark Zuckerberg. There's, I forgot his name, uh, uh, the NVIDIA CEO. There's so many great ones out there. You see the world of men, right? Internally, they're probably jealous of each other, but we will never know that. But in the public world, they act like they're individually gone, right? Because it's true. No one, there isn't a second Elon Musk. There isn't a second Sam Altman. And there would never be a second Jenny Talk. There could be a second Professor Lee. Now, she could do exactly what I'll do. She's a female. I respect her because I empower female. The reason why I empower female is because I know how difficult it is to be a female. Okay? So I will empower her. Now, do I wish for her to uh, uh, excel me? Of, of course I do. But am I going to uh, sit back and not come? Of course not. I'm going to fight. So when you fight, there can only be one winner. I, I wouldn't say fight, but compete. You get what I'm saying? But if she wins, I would congratulate her. Just like Elon Musk. Sam Altman is winning right now. There's nothing that Elon can do, okay? So that's the world out there. So in this classroom, there's a lot more gentlemen than the ladies. So you guys can all go out and be, you know, open AI, Microsoft. It's a world of competition out there. And, and you guys should not, you know, even if you envy the, next, the guy next door, it, it should fuel you even more to be better. Just like how that Mr. Lee fueled me to be who I am today. Get what I'm saying? So that's how I think. Yes. You said you were like familiar with venture capital stuff and all that. What's the biggest mistake you see in uh, startups? Oh, there's a lot because I, I I mentor many many startups. One of the biggest one I've seen, and maybe we can conclude it after this one because I I kind of see everybody's getting a little bit tired. I welcome the question, but maybe she will welcome me back another time. If you guys like for me to come back, I would be more than happy to come back. But let's wrap it with this question, and this is real life experience. I was mentoring this group. Both founders were from Princeton. Okay. They grew up in Princeton. Remember Mark Zuckerberg's story, how him and his partner were from Harvard? Same thing, but these two guys were from Princeton. Had a startup out here. I was their mentor at, in Santa Monica. Started out really well. They raised a couple seed, pre-seed. And then as things were picking up, they started fighting each other. I mean, not physical fight, but fight fight. You guys get what I'm saying. Here's the number one lesson. Never, ever start out with a partnership with two founders. I don't care how much you love each other when you guys dorm together and be 50-50. You know why? Because who's going to win? You can't vote with 50-50. So when I mentor those two, they had 50-50. Then I say, shit. And so you know what we have to do? Good thing that they took in some investments. So the investors got to vote, right? And by that time, when we went to the investor, the whole thing crashed. That, that entire startup, it would have been so, so good. Uh, but because, so therefore, okay, so here's the conclusion. I gave you guys a clue. When you start out being partnership with anyone, I don't care if it's your girlfriend, you love her to death, you say that I trust her with my life, don't be foolish. Because trust me, I've been in relationships, personal one, business one. Never, ever sign a 50-50. Always 51 to 49. Because when you start out like that, it's easier to sign the agreement with 51-49. You get what I'm saying? Then once when you build up that startup, no one wants to bring from 50 down to 49. The greed mentality, it will start to come in. Does that make sense? But when you start out, nobody see how well that startup's going. They will tend to say, all right, fine. You're the CEO, you know, so you can take 51. I'm the president or the CFO, I'll take 49. It's easier at the beginning. You guys getting what I'm saying? Then you don't trust anybody. I don't give a fuck what it is. Your girlfriend, your dorm mate, uh, Mark. Look at Mark Zuckerberg, there's a fight. Look at Bill Gates uh, and his part. There was a fight. Every, the only two things, people, I don't think they ever fought all the Google guys, right? The two Google guys. I don't think they fought. But that's rare. The girlfriends don't. You have to have an agreement. And if you have 5149, you're fine. So that was the biggest mistake that I mentor. Two guys from, uh, uh, um, uh, what was that say? Princeton. Super smart dude. That startup could have done well, okay? Right here, Santa Monica. But they blew it because greed kicked in after they raised a few rounds. Money start coming out. People start liking their app. That's when the whole thing fell. You see, so partnerships is a two. Uh, it's a it's the double edged sword, right? But it's fine. Partnerships are great. Two founders are great. Never be 50-50 That you should be fine because if there happens to be a dispute, you can easily resolve that. One of you guys got to go away. 
You get what I'm saying? And then the other one keep it and keep on moving. But when it's 50-50 and then the shareholders get involved, nobody believes you guys anymore. It's like you bring the entire, there's too many cooks in the kitchen at that time. It's never gonna make it. And that one, they failed. And that was the biggest one that I mentor. Uh, the, 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 the CEO is still my friend, uh, but his partner, the dorm guy, the other one, because I, I didn't take his side. I took the side of the CEO. So, but they're, they're not in the startup world anymore. They never came back to do because of course, after that, how are they gonna raise money again? Who's gonna trust them? You only have one shot, you know? So does that help? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, was I okay? Thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you so much.